the, the Galapagos um, are a very small area in which uh, about 16 major islands are in most cases within sight of each other, but far enough apart that organisms are allowed to live there and establish a certain amount of genetic diversity. So it's a, an evolutionist dream come true, a place where you can see the process of evolution actually going on, and Darwin uh, stumbled onto that by great fortune when the beagle landed here in September of 1835. When Charles Darwin was 22 years old, he had just graduated from Cambridge University and was on track to be a clergyman. But instead, he got a job as a naturalist on a ship called the Beagle. Well, the Beagle's job as a military vessel was to go out and survey various harbors around South America. It was typical colonial goals to obtain power through maps. It was a tradition in the British Navy that they took a naturalist on board, and Darwin was the lucky choice. So Darwin and his uh, servant, Sims Covington, uh, basically would go out and collect plants and insects and birds and sometimes uh, marine creatures and try to preserve them and uh, get them back on ship. It was a very labor-intensive thing. Uh, you, were, you had a long, busy day when you were Charles Darwin collecting at a new locality. On return to England, uh, Darwin delivered his various specimens to specialists who could then describe them for him. And the birds all went to a man named John Gould, who was at that time working at the London Zoological Society. And he took one look at Darwin's bird collection from South America, instantly recognized the Galapagos birds, and he began describing those birds as fast as he could to get priority in the naming for them. And Gould had uh, a number of big surprises for Darwin. The first of which was um, the fact that Darwin had collected four specimens of mockingbird. He had recognized they were a little different by island, uh, but he thought, oh, gee, uh, they, they must just be varieties. Well, John Gould took one look at these mockingbirds and said, three of these four are distinct species. And Darwin uh, immediately said, are you sure? And Gould responded, if, if these aren't good species, then all the knowledge of ornithology has to be given up. Well, what is a species? Later in EVO, we'll ask modern scientists how they define species. In Darwin's day, the word species referred to groups of organisms whose individual members all looked and behaved distinctly like one another. So these are all marine iguanas and were different from other organisms. This is a lava lizard. John Gould described and measured the mockingbird specimens carefully. He was convinced they were different species because they looked consistently different from one another. Darwin had already observed differences in the mockingbird's behavior and in their environments. So mockingbirds from different islands are different species. And Gould had a second surprise for Darwin, and that is a lot of birds Darwin hadn't thought were finches were, according to, to John Gould, members of this unusual geospised uh, uh, family. And, uh, and Darwin suddenly realized, oh my God, there's a whole group of these things that could have followed the same route that the mockingbirds did, evolving on separate islands. Well, one of the funny stories on, on the Beagle is uh, the fact that Darwin was told by the vice governor of the Galapagos that the tortoises differed by island. And Darwin tells us he didn't pay sufficient attention at first to this. And we know he really didn't because on the way to Tahiti, he and his fellow crew members ate uh, about 18 tortoises that had been brought aboard the Beagle as a source of fresh meat. Well, obviously, if you realized that these tortoises were going to revolutionize the history of science, you wouldn't eat the evidence on the way to Tahiti. When Darwin visited the Galapagos Islands, he believed, like most people at that time, that species never changed. This was called the fixity of species. The alternative concept that species might evolve, might change over time, this idea was not new to Darwin. 
In the 1770s, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, a physician and philosopher, had suggested that all animals had arisen from a common ancestor. In 1801, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, a French naturalist, developed ideas about how species could change in response to their environment. But Darwin was a creationist. He believed that each species was created by God exactly as they are today. So he's visiting the Galapagos as a creationist, and that explains one of the great uh, mistakes that he made in failing to label the birds by island. Um, if you're, if you're a, a creationist, you do not imagine that islands that are extremely close together are going to have separately created a species. After a while, not immediately, but after a while, he became aware of the fact that on different islands one could find apparent relatives of each other, say two mockingbirds on two different islands, related to each other, but not exactly the same. And this eventually led him to question the fixity of species and develop his ideas about evolution. Darwin wondered, suppose a group of mockingbirds from the mainland had somehow traveled across the water and ended up on a Galapagos island. Perhaps a storm carried them there. Sometime later, another group somehow got from the first island to another, and then another. As time passed, each isolated population of mockingbirds went through successive generations, and each evolved in its own way. Eventually, after a long time, they each became a different species. Pondering this branching pattern, Darwin reasoned that all mockingbirds in the world probably descended from a common ancestor. This led Darwin to wonder if all organisms, all of life, had descended from one common ancestor, with countless changes along the way. While this conclusion went against Darwin's basic beliefs, he didn't turn away from the evidence. At that time, being a, an evolutionist was a pretty risque thing to be doing and it was contradictory to scriptures. It was not the kind of thing you went and publicly advertised. So he kept his mouth shut. However, he was very excited and he immediately opened a series of notebooks to begin collecting systematically uh, evidence on the issue of evolution. Later in his life, after 20 years of studying evolution, Darwin would write that admitting that species might change over time was like confessing a murder. Once Darwin became an evolutionist in March of 1837, he had an idea that things evolved, but he didn't have a mechanism. So he kept searching, and it was uh, about 18 months after he had become an evolutionist that he happened to read a copy of Thomas Robert Malthus's book on population. And in that book, Malthus describes the fact that the Food supply generally increases in nature at an arithmetic rate, but the number of offspring born increases generally at a geometric rate. And so there's always a constant struggle for existence between the amount of organisms born and the number that can be fed, essentially. And Darwin instantly realized if you have that struggle for existence and you have a little bit of variation in species, as you see in the Galapagos, for example, that there will be what he called natural selection of those variant forms that are the best adapted for that struggle for existence, and boom, he had a theory. I do think the Malthus moment is as close to a, a great moment of discovery as you get in the history of science. So this was Darwin's breakthrough, one of several big ideas that he spent his life examining. All organisms evolve through natural selection and have descended from a common ancestor. And we know now from many, many studies that Darwin was absolutely right on the money. 
like in many, many ways. I mean, Darwin was so incredibly insightful that he figured out this must be what was going on, even though at the time he had very, very little evidence. Now, you know, more than a hundred years later, we have lots of evidence that he was exactly right. All organisms, populations of organisms, grow at rates that cannot be sustained by their environment. There are more born, there are more hatched, there are more seeds that sprout, there are more spores in the air, there are more produced always under all times that can ever survive. Now, since there are more that can ever survive and only a few survive, that's what natural selection is. But how does natural selection actually work? I mean, what selects what? How did the spikes on this caterpillar come to be?